very much, Madam Chairman. I, I, I have to start, take a few seconds to say um, what an honor and a privilege and a pleasure it is to, uh, to be speaking here in this session uh, and to have uh, one of my favorite professors uh, as, as the chairwoman. So uh, thank you again for the invitation. Um, uh, this is a topic um, that uh, I've been agonizing over for the last three years, as, as, as many people from this part of the world uh, have been. Um, what exactly did people mean by social justice? Um, the slogan of, of the revolutions in Tunisia and Egypt um, that was also uh, used in other places um, where we haven't had the same type of regime change uh, was bread, freedom, social justice. What did they mean by social justice? Uh, Ahmed Galad yesterday likened uh, the quest for an understanding of social justice to the philosopher's quest for truth, uh, you know, the blind people in a dark room searching for a black cat that doesn't exist. Um, but um, th th there's, there's an old saying that if um, the core theme in Christianity is love, the core theme in Islam is justice. And certainly there's a lot written uh, in, in um, Islamic discourses, both classical and contemporary, uh, on the issue of justice. And the question is, um, would that tell us anything uh, that um, we wouldn't know just by reading uh, what economists have written. And I must tell Professor Romer, you write too much. I had to change uh, my eyeglass prescription <laughs> reading uh, your work. Um, so the first question is this. Um, I would like to uh, suggest not that um, um, focusing on the poor is a bad thing. Of course, all um, social, religious, and ethical standards will tell us that we have to uh, worry primarily about the poor. Uh, but I think when people said social justice, they meant something more. And um, so the first puzzle we're facing is this. Um, we know what the mid-2000s new Washington consensus, as uh, Stiglitz started calling it, was. It's the old Washington consensus, neoliberalism, uh, free market economics, plus some emphasis on institutions and social safety nets for the uh, poor. This is grounded in the uh, theories of social justice, and I'm just mentioning um, two here, John Rawls and Marcia Sand, but of course there are many, many people who have contributed to refining the visions, but it's really about social safety nets, worry about the worst off in society, and that's all that matters. So if you have a, a distribution that is all crunched at the bottom with you know, the top 1% having most of the income, most of the wealth, and everybody else is just above the poverty line, you're better off than something that is um, more um, evenly distributed. Um, and um, th th there's a question of whether or not this um, was acceptable, this vision of what social justice entails was acceptable to the people who revolted. Um, in, in Egypt and Tunisia in particular, these were the uh, poster children of success of the new Washington consensus. Um, if you just go and you know, all the papers are still up on the web, you go to the IMF and World Bank sites in the period 2008-2010, you know, they, they were bragging about how great Egypt was. You know, the, first the best reformer in the region and then the best reformer in the world just before a revolution erupts. And they're demanding social justice, and the question is, what is that social justice? Uh, to the extent that Islamism, um, a term that I'm not going to try to define, but I think everybody knows roughly what it means, um, um, was, was central to um, the political discourse, if you will, about how to implement social justice. Um, but I want to stress here, the people who organized these um, revolts were not poor. This was not you know, a, a Russian revolt by the peasants. These were Twitter, Facebook using um, upper middle class or middle class youth. So it was the middle class that revolted. Of course, unlike say in the Occupy movement in the US where they would explicitly say the middle class is being disadvantaged and so on, in this culture it's a lot easier to talk about the poor uh, because it sounds too self-serving to talk about yourself. So indeed, um, if we go back to the mid-2000s, I remember people who were trying to sound the alarm in Washington circles uh, were always just dismissed offhand because um, we were told, what are you talking about? You don't have poverty in the Middle East. 
You know, look, look at Sub-Saharan Africa, look at Latin America, look at South Asia. You guys are just spoiled. You're doing just fine. In reality, if we look, um, and I'll talk uh, briefly about theories of justice going back to Aristotle, usually we think about relative uh, or proportional justice. That's how Aristotle defines um, justice, um, a descriptive justice, is proportional um, justice. So what I'm going to look here at is um, the ratio of the incomes of the top decile to the bottom decile. And the data here, uh, I, I, I take to heart, of course, the criticisms that uh, Bourguignon had yesterday about the quality of this data, whether it's biased by exclusion of the top 1% and so on, or mis mismeasurement. Uh, I'm using the wider um, uh, United Nations University um, data set, which has, which has deciles at different points in time. And we can see that if we take the ratio of the top deciles uh, share to the bottom decile share. Um, indeed, the countries in the region seem to be doing fine. The, 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 the poor are, in some sense, catching up. The, the ratio of the top decile to the bottom decile is declining. In a country like Korea, which is the poster child for uh, balanced, equitable, um, inclusive growth, we have more divergence between the top decile and the bottom decile. So if you're doing better than Korea, you're not doing too badly. So the social safety nets were actually working from the Rawlsian, Senian, um, new Washington consensus point of view. Hence, the World Bank and the IMF were saying, yes, you're doing everything right. Keep on going. Oh, it's... it's uh, okay, so I don't know if it's, if it's readable or not. So, um, for instance, if you take Egypt, uh, you start around 1960, the top um, decile was earning uh, about 22 times what the bottom decile was earning. And by the time, um, you know, the, the, just before the revolutions, it was closer to 10%. So, um, the gap proportionately was cut in half. Social safety nets were working. A lot of the work, of course, was done during the uh, Nasser era and its continuation into the 70s. So it's mostly 60s and 70s. There was a little bit of a regression back starting in 91, but it didn't do too much for the top decile compared to uh, what I'm going to show next, which is the middle class. So now if we look at how the middle class was doing uh, relative to the top decile, uh, I'll take the ratio of the top decile's income to the fifth decile. Um, and there you would see that um, Korea, um, I guess I can do this, you can see Korea um, has, made, has made relatively um, uh, a great um, uh, advance um, relative to other countries. And if you look now at Egypt, for instance, um, it started out with a ratio of the top decile to the fifth decile being around you know, 4.8 or so. Improved quite a bit during the Nasser era. Continued and then starting with the liberalization program from the early 90s, the regression now basically makes the middle class lose all that it has gained vis-a-vis -vis the top class over that uh, period. So these are the people who are angry. These are the people who were catching up or the parents were catching up and all of a sudden they find themselves regressing back to what their grandparents were experiencing before the 52 revolution. So why would this be something we look at for social justice? I mean, after all, we're always thinking about the poor. Well, if we go back to sort of the most canonical of texts on distributive justice, everybody starts from Book 5 in the Kemachian Ethics. Uh, and uh, Aristotle saying justice is always the middle term between two extremes. And in the case of distribution, it is determined by proportionality. And of course, he was talking about class structure. So um, there is proportionality relative to merit. And merit could be uh, based on aristocracy, based on knowledge, based on any criteria that the society will choose for itself. Uh, both Plato and Aristotle were, were of that view. Um, it's interesting that from an economic point of view, he then adds sort of a, a proto um, theory, uh, labor theory of value. He says, so the prices of the products of the farmer and the shoemaker when they trade in barter should be determined by the relative merits of the two. And then he says, but past that first trade, 
you know, he, he leaves it open, so market prices can be determined any way you want. But in terms of fairness, it's, it's now defined as shares. So the middle class, if they feel that the rich, and we could hear it yesterday, right? The animated um, statements, especially by, by um, Romer and Flaubert about you know, the top 1%, the top 1%, you, you could sense this idea they're getting more than their fair share. These you know, greedy actors getting more than their fair share. What does that mean? It means others are not getting their fair share, the middle class. So were they not getting their fair share, and what does that mean? So we go from Aristotle, who was you know, the philosopher when you talk about enlightenment um, work in Europe, and to the commentator, Ibn Rushd or Averroes. Um, unfortunately, the, um, what's called the middle commentary on Nicomachean ethics by uh, Ibn Rushd is not available to us. It's been lost. We have a Hebrew translation and Latin translation, but most likely they're just translations of the uh, text itself, not of, of the, his commentary. So we don't have it, but we have elements of it in Ibn Rushd's other writings. So we can look at how Ibn Rushd looked at justice in exchange. So this is commutative justice, but as we will see in Islamic discourse, there is really no distinction between distributive and commutative justice. And there are a few people uh, in, in law and economics who um, have, have tried to make the argument also that this distinction is usually superficial because after all, in every uh, a commutative transaction, there is a distributive aspect. Did you pay too much? Did you pay too little? Did you pay a fair price? So what uh, Ibn Rushd does is he, um, he, here he's actually discussing the laws of usury and determining whether or not it's a just exchange when you, um, when you lend a person in a commutative sense and receive something more, or if you sell them and receive something more, how do you determine what's the just ratio for exchange? And the most important part, I don't want to get into the details of the jurisprudence here, but the most important part is that he ends up saying that, well, if the goods have relatively the same benefits, then the ratio, then equity, justice, is determined by equality. And by definition, then it means that if there are different benefits, then the prices will be different. And since he said, you know, proportionality, um, a la Aristotle, is the measure, essentially he's saying, the quantity ratio is determined by the price ratio, and the price ratio is determined by the ratio of the benefits. Now, this is um, five centuries before calculus, so if you just add the word marginal, the benefit of the last unit consumed, this is Pareto efficiency. Um, the, the, there is no sort of separate idea now about the merits. That has vanished. The labor theory of value has vanished. It's purely determined by market prices that will equate the ratios of marginal utilities. Well, that's what we teach every um, intermediate economics um, student. So we're already almost there uh, in Islamic thought, um, and, and much of the idea of, of merit has, has disappeared. Now, Islamic thought is very much grounded in law. It's, it's a very interesting thing, even though so, so some people extend the statement that if the essence of Christianity is love, the essence of Islam is justice, they say the essence of Judaism is the law, you know, the, the, the tablets and so on. Um, so I approach this from a law and economics perspective, and I love this quote by Richard Posner, who, um, along with, with Rawls, of course, sort of gave birth to the field of, of law and economics or the economic analysis of law, which I then applied to Islamic transactions law. He says, look, don't get fixated on the rhetoric of why people say something is just. Um, legal training is really to go beyond the rhetoric and find out what's the economic grounds for the decision. And in most cases, you'll find that it's really about efficiency. And indeed, if you apply this analysis, um, I've shown in my work that um, you can see that Islamic jurisprudence actually evolved as a common law system. And um, unfortunately, in the 20th century, when Islamists appeared on the scene, they thought of it as a civil code, as a list of do's and don'ts that is sort of cast in stone quite literally, um, which of course created legal arbitrage opportunities, one of which is so-called Islamic finance. Uh, how do you take something take it apart, put it back together uh, using uh, medieval uh, contracts, which both um, uh, circumvents the efficiency-enhancing regulatory content of the law and ends up um, um, 
costing more. So it's a double efficiency loss. Now, when, when careful thinkers like Ibn Rushd, Daverros, and Ibn Khaldun, um, in you know, uh, two centuries apart roughly, um, when they went from being scholars to, want to trying to actually apply justice, they did it from the bench, and their view was justice is just legal justice. So that reinforces why Islamists, if they look back in the literature, they see, well, it's the law. There are just laws cast in tablets and just apply them, and we have this body of jurisprudence that we should apply today. Um, and it's for that reason that there is no Islamic theory of justice. There isn't even an Islamic theory of contract. Some, some people say there is an Islamic theory of contracts with, with, because each contract has its own rules based on the local conventions under which it evolved and so on. Islamic scholars weren't interested in theories. They weren't interested in abstractions. They weren't interested in axioms and proofs. They were interested in practical applications and therefore um, there is no Islamic theory of justice and after agonizing over it for a long time, um, I'm wondering, do we even need one? So, if we then go from, okay, if we don't have a theory that we can ground in sort of the canonical texts of Islam, what can we do? So, Flaubert yesterday said, well, in order to talk about justice, you have to do interpersonal utility comparisons, and now it's not a positive exercise anymore, it's a normative exercise. But for societies, there is a positive exercise of figuring out what are the norms according to which people will, just, will, 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 will evaluate uh, a distribution or a procedure as just or unjust. And as proof both that there is no Islamic theory of justice and that we need to look at the data, let me just remind you that in the mid-20th century, we had very accomplished Islamic scholars, Mustafa Sibai was a Syrian jurist, uh, the head of the jurisprudence department in Damascus University, and wrote a, a back then not very controversial book that became controversial later on, which was called Ishtirakat al-Islam, the socialism of Islam. And he was bragging in his memoirs about how he went to the Soviet Union and explained to them that all these social, uh, socialist principles were already enshrined in Islam and so on. We, we forget, you know, and, uh, Ahmed Shawqi in, in, in his book, uh, in, in his poem, you know, it says, it says uh, uh, commemorating the birth of the Prophet says, you were the leader of all the socialists and so on. So if you were living in the 40s and 50s, even the 60s, in this part of the world, you saw socialism in the Islamic canon, in the Quran, the prophetic tradition. And so they, they took elements of the jurisprudence and extrapolated. There is no theory, so you can pick and choose. So they picked and chose, for instance, that there is a prophetic tradition that say people, there's communal ownership of three things, water, pastures, and fire. Um, and then they took an incident where uh, property was expropriated from the owner of an orchard whose trees had trespassed on somebody else's. Um, and they said, okay, see? So we have proof that nationalization is permissible. Indeed, it is required for all vital industries and so on. Um, they took uh, from the tradition um, that uh, th there was a time when the prophet and um, his, um, his um, second successor, Omar, decided to distribute the spoils based on merit. So um, just to give an example, for instance, after the Battle of Hanayn, the prophet decided to give the bulk of the spoils to the traditional aristocracy of Arabia. And a man, this is available to us in the, in the, in the authentic books of, of, of hadith, of prophetic tradition. And then a man said, in the presence of the prophet, he said, this is not a just distribution. This was not really for the sake of God. And the prophet got very angry and he said, what do you mean? What standard of justice can you apply other than whatever I choose? The law, I, I choose the law and therefore this is what justice is. And the second, um, the second, um, um, the second and, and, and fourth, uh, the second and third um, successors, caliphs, did the same thing. They distributed unequally, whereas the first and the fourth decided, no, we're going to treat all Muslims equally and distribute the spoils completely. So they could pick and choose. At the time, 40s, 50s, 60s, people like Taha Hussein, uh, a, a very accomplished uh, literary figure, people like Sayyid Qutb, the prototype Islamist, basically thought the correct thing was the equal distribution, the Abu Bakr and Ali approach, and the incorrect approach was the 
uh, division according to merit. So that gave them grounds for more socialist um, and, and so on. At the same time, of course, we have many, many scholars who all suggest that Islamic jurisprudence is very much what John Locke would be telling you. And of course, there is historical evidence that a lot of John Locke's thought was influenced by his reading of Hayyib ibn Akhdan and you know, the, the whole uh, issue of the autodidact bringing up um, the, the Renaissance and so on, which I'm not going to get into, but basically you have the exact same rules, you know, what, 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 what are the rules of acquiring property, what are the rules of transferring property and so on, and as long as there's no coercion, everything goes. Well, that could very well be Nozick, that could very, bell, very well be von Hayek, it's libertarian. And most jurists will agree to this, they say unless you have a case of extreme need, you have to trust the law in terms of how people can acquire and dispose of property and transfer property. So um, we have everything justified based on the same tradition, the same body of law, from extreme socialism to justify what Nasser et al. were doing, or to justify libertarianism. It's proof that there's really no theory, there cannot be a theory, because you can pick and choose elements of the tradition to do anything you want. In the 40s to the 70s, people picked the first set of examples and, and extrapolated from them, ignoring the others. And then afterwards, people were picking the latter set of examples and extrapolating from them, ignoring the first. So, so really, it becomes a question of what do Muslims today believe, right? It becomes purely a positive issue because there's nothing really theoretical that's authentic, sort of intrinsic in the text that we're going to discover. So, I'm going to start with uh, data from the um, uh, five, minutes. five minutes. Oh my goodness! Okay, so that's not fair distribution. <laughs> um, see, I want equality. Equity should be equality in this case. Um, so um, okay, so I'll go quickly. Um, so let's take as the standard for neoliberalism this question that was asked in the uh, uh, spring Pew 2012. Do you agree and to what extent with the following statement that most people are better off in a free market economy despite increased inequality, that some people will be rich and some people will be poor? And we can see that, you know, and, and I highlighted the, the majority Muslim countries, so you can see that Turkey um, is, is very much either completely agreeing or mostly agreeing with that statement. Lebanon is very much pro-neoliberalism. And then as you go down the list of the countries we have in that sample, um, Egypt is sort of split exactly 50-50. 52% are either completely agreeing or mostly agreeing with the neoliberalism thesis. And, um, and then you go down to Jordan, where now it's, now it's going the other way around. They're not sure that neoliberalism really makes most people better off. But does that relate to Islamism? So we can take, um, first of all, what, what measure of Islamism are we going to use? There are two we could use. One is a question that's asked in the pew that, um, you know, should, lo should laws follow um, uh, the teachings of the Quran strictly, only accept the principles, something that was debated ad nauseum in writing of constitutions in Egypt and Tunisia, and you can see why it get different um, results based on these polls. Um, so Pakistan, of course, says yes, you have to apply the rules of the Quran strictly, and then, but not, not far behind are Jordan and Egypt, right? 73% say you should apply them strictly in Jordan, 61% say in Egypt. You can see Tunisia is a very different case. Tunisia, the vast majority are saying only take the general principles, but don't worry about applying them strictly, and so on. So I'll take Jordan because Pakistan, uh, I don't consider it to be in the region. So I'll take Jordan um, as the example of um, sort of extreme Islamism for that purpose. But there's another question that is asked, now I'm going to the World Values Survey. This, this is data mostly from the 2000 um, um, uh, wave. And here the question was, should only laws of the Sharia be applied? And now you see a slightly different distribution. Saudi Arabia comes first. Egypt gets slightly ahead of Jordan there. But they're still roughly, you know, if you take both strongly agree and agree, they're roughly the same level of anti-secularism. So we have strong anti-secularism in Egypt and Jordan, much weaker elsewhere. Um, okay, so is there a relationship between uh, anti-secularism and egalitarianism? Uh, we can see a very strong relationship. So this question is whether uh, rules, laws should follow the Quran. 
this question is about um, whether there should be uh, a small discrepancy between the rich and the poor. And you can say between those who say this is Im strong, very important or somewhat important, uh, you, have, um, you have more than two thirds of the sample um, in, in that category who are extremely anti-secular, who say you should apply the laws of the Quran strongly. So there's a confounding between anti-secularism and egalitarianism. But wait, it's not uh, that simple. Does anti-secularism necessarily then mean that we don't like neoliberalism because neoliberalism says everybody will be better off even though the gap between the rich and the poor may be growing? Well, no, there's actually no relationship. Um, so if you look at anti-secularism, should um, uh, you apply the Quran strictly, etc. And here, the neoliberalism, are most people better off? Actually, um, it's, it's almost 50-50 uh, for the extremely anti-secular. So you have the anti-secular uh, neoliberals, and you have the anti-secular socialists, and everything in between. Anti-secularism does not tell you where the person falls on their view towards neoliberalism. How do you reconcile that with a strong egalitarianism? I'll get there in a little while. So let's go to Jordan, where you see this extreme. So now the, question, uh, the questions here are slightly different. If you were to have a democracy, if people are deciding on the distribution uh, rules, um, this question is, you know, is it essential for democracy that you tax the rich and subsidize the poor, redistribute? And this question is whether religious authorities should interpret the law. You see a whopping 42% of the uh, people questioned here choosing both extremes. The extreme of anti-secularism and the extreme of redistribution, which is not the same thing as rejecting all inequalities. Because if you ask, well, I guess I have to, to, to skip some, right? So let me skip. I'll skip every discussion on public ownership. Take my word for it. There's no support for, nation, for nationalization of industries. That's, I'll, I'll just focus on the redistribution issue. Th these are the two components sort of neoliberalism that are questioned. But I'll, I'll skip. I'll have to skip one. Um, this is, I, I, I do an artificial intelligence analysis of all the, the, the questions that were asked, and the important thing here is to be able to create what is called uh, dependence separation to show that even though variables can be very highly correlated, and even if you run regressions, you still get a very high partial correlation, that's meaningless, you have conditional independence if you condition on one particular variable. So I'll give you two examples quickly. So for instance, and this is the important part, there are two questions. One of them is, is it essential that you redistribute, tax the rich and subsidize the poor? And the other question is, do you want more income inequality in order to incentivize people to work harder, or do you want less inequality? And you can see that the majority want both. They want the free market um, uh, that, that results in unequal distribution initially, because they recognize that's going to make the pie grow, but then they want redistribution at the same time. Okay? These are not two uh, uh, incompatible things. That's what they think. So in Egypt, you get the same thing. And, and oh, so I can tell you this quickly. The, the interesting thing is the two variables are so highly correlated, but they're conditionally independent if you condition on whether or not you have free and fair elections. People think if you have free and fair elections, people will keep the relatively neoliberal system. They'll just demand more redistributive taxation. Same thing in Egypt. If you look at the inequality uh, versus, so this is the redistribution. This is uh, this is the redistribution variable. This is the initial income inequality for incentives. And again, the majority. It's a little less concentrated, but still, the majority want both. They want high initial inequality, good incentives, free market enterprise, but then redistribute at the end. That's what you expect the rich to do on their own. And there's a great story about this told by scholars um, about Morocco and so on. Maybe in the questions I'll have an opportunity to say it because it's really very illustrative. Uh, I'll skip the private ownership. Um, uh, Egypt has the same um, confounding redistribution with anti-egalitarianism. So the, their view of the law is the law says you should redistribute. Islam says you should redistribute. But it doesn't say you should have public ownership, it doesn't say you should have more equal distribution uh, in the beginning. I know I have to jump quickly, so if you go country by country, you will see there is no relationship. So just look at the leftmost. This is the anti-secular guys on back to Pew. So these are the guys who are saying you should strictly apply the laws of the Quran. 
You can see in Egypt, that doesn't tell you anything about where they fall on neoliberalism. It's almost 50-50. The same is true in Tunisia. Well, most of them here are the sort of soft uh, anti-secularists, if you will. They, you should apply the principles of the Quran, but not strictly. And again, they're split 50-50. Um, you can go to Lebanon, where, of course, the majority say it should have no influence whatsoever, but still it's split right. Uh, actually, it's, it's, it's a little bit pro-neoliberalism. And in Turkey, which is a little bit like Tunisia, you see it's also more pro-neoliberalism. So in general, anti-secularist Islamists are not against neoliberalism. They just want redistribution. So to conclude, um, and I can say that first line with a great deal of uh, confidence. There is no such thing as Islamic economics. There is no such thing as Islamic theory of justice. At least it doesn't exist now. I'm not saying it cannot exist, but I'm not sure if it's either possible or necessary. Because Muslims seem to be making up their minds epoch by epoch based on political considerations and they can always find justification in the religious text for whatever it is that they want. Um, but there is a consistent egalitarian streak that cannot be ignored. And so my conclusion is that I think Muslim societies in general will accept the neoliberal paradigm. They just want more redistribution. And of course, the composition of each country and its history and so on will determine which policies will work and which will not work towards that end. Thank you very much.